So this is the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, wherein we see the over overview that is described over here. That we have forty six verses in the first chapter. Now the Bhagavad Gita begins with a description of the two forces. The Bhagavad Gita is actually a book spoken on the battlefield. I will not be in this session going too much into the Sanskrit verses because that will take a lot of time. The Bhagavad Gita is spoken on a battlefield where there are two families or two members of the same family, two cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas are about to fight. And the villain in this piece, the main cause of the war is Duryodhan. And he is overcome. He is very confident that we will be winning the war very easily. But when he sees his, the force of his opponents, the virtuous Pandavas, he is concerned, and then he assesses the two parties. For those who approach the Bhagavad Gita as a philosophical book, the first chapter can seem sometimes bewildering. There are so many strange names, and it seems to be such a strange setting. And I talk about the setting of the Gita earlier. A later in the later part of this chapter, but here the key thing is that the first verses it is that Duryodhan assesses both the sides, who are the strong warriors on the opposite side and on his side, but there he misses out on God. The Bhagavad Gita is spoken by Krishna. The word Bhagavad Gita as it is means. Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, the song of God. So Krishna is present, but Duryodhan doesn't count Krishna at all. So sometimes when a lot is spoken, what is not spoken is most important. For example, if, uh, if a war is going on and a newspaper gives reports of everything except the war. Doesn't need to come to hide or what? So what is not spoken sometimes speaks very loudly. Like the well elephant group speaks about. So the Bhagavad Gita begins to not counting God at all, and that represents a materialistic or a godless vision of the world. So the Bhagavad Gita begins with this contrast. On one side is Duryodhan. He is doing a material assessment with no God in the picture. And on the other side is Arjuna. He has God right by his side. And still, we will see he will go into illusion. But eventually, because he connects with God, he will become enlightened. So the setting of the first chapter, the first section is describing how the material vision doesn't take God into the account. Then, from text thirteen onwards, the focus shifts from Duryodhan side. See, when we consider a spiritual journey, we begin with the material world around us, and and most people are just materially conscious. We could say there are there are materialistic and there are uh, godless, and there can be materialistic and godly. There could be pious materialism. So the the Bhagavad Gita's first chapter depicts the journey from uh, materialistic godlessness to materialistic godliness, and eventually to spiritual godliness. So Arjuna, at the at least in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, is a godly person, but he is at a material level godly. So here, what happens? The intention, he, his intention is to fight. All the Pandavas are going to fight, and they. Are blowing their conscience and indicating their desire to fight, but at that time, suddenly Arjuna gets a strange desire. He gets the desire to go in between the two armies to see who is fighting. And at this point, this desire becomes the seed or the source of his illusion. The intention to fight is there. When we have decided to do something, we need to see those things that 
enhance that intention, that determination. Arjuna desires to go in between the two armies. Now, that is no man's land. And the no man's land is a terrible place to be in because we don't belong to either side over there and we might be attacked by both sides. So Arjuna finds himself isolated in no man's land. And quite often, you know, we turn toward God when we find ourselves in that no man's land. No man's land is just a usage. You could say no woman's land also. That is just the conventional way of using it. So Arjuna is alone and he sees on both sides his loved ones. And he, he now, of course, there are the villains on the side of the opposite side, but there also are his elders. There is grandsire, there is martial teacher. And he starts thinking, how can I fight against them? At that point, his perception has sabotaged his intention. And this also happens to us. We start off deciding to do something, but then when we encounter, when we see things which, which weaken our determination, our intention, then we can't follow through. So then, after that, is the confusion that is described. The confusion is, he is not even sure, what should I do? What should I not do? Now, interestingly, what is the confusion of Arjuna? That confusion is between two roles that he is having. The two roles are, he is, we all have different roles in our lives. We might be parents, we might be professionals, we might be friends. Sometimes as parents, our children want us for something. As professionals, our boss wants us for some other work. And maybe our friends want us to come out for a party. Now, we are pulled in different directions. Now, this is casual, but for this is, it's, it's serious, but it's casual in the sense that no life is a threat. But for Arjuna, two roles were pulling him into different directions. One was his dynastic duty and the other was his warrior duty. The Sanskrit words are his Kula Dharma and his Kshatriya Dharma. The Kula Dharma, the, the dynastic duty told him that you have to protect your dynasty. And on the opposite side also are the members of your dynasty. How can you fight against them? And his <coughs> warrior duty said, no, but those people are aggressors. Those people are violent. They will disrupt society. It was not just he was fighting for himself. He was a martial guardian of society. And he had to check those who were disrupting the social and spiritual order of society. So he gets confused. Should I fight or should I not fight? And he thinks, oh, those are my family members. I cannot fight against them. So he says, even if I win the kingdom, what will the use of that? If it is got by the death of our loved ones. And therefore, he rejects. He rejects the plan to fight. He puts aside his bow in dismay. Now when he puts aside his bow like this, at that point, what happens? So now I will focus on some themes. Now for most of us, this idea of a war can be very disturbing. Now why, would, why is the Bhagavad Gita spoken on a battlefield? So I'll talk about this at three levels, the literal, the metaphorical, and the metaphysical. The literal, it's a war, and but the point of the Bhagavad Gita, as we'll see later, is not to justify the war. It is to justify duty. The, the setting of the Bhagavad Gita is used on the battlefield primarily to show the urgency of spirituality. Most people feel that, oh, the spiritual philosophy and all this, I don't have time for this. In the future, I'll do it. But, because I have more important things to do right now, more urgent things to do right now. People, I'm a go-getter. Yes, Arjuna was the ultimate go-getter. He was the world's greatest archer of his times. But even he, even somebody who's a go-getter, needs to know where to go and what to get. So our conceptions, our vision, our understandings are the basis of our actions. 
So even when somebody is having something as urgent to do as fight a war, even then they need philosophical grounding to shape their actions. So, the, so it's a literal setting, but the essence is not literal. Now, if you talk about the metaphorical, the metaphorical setting is, the metaphorical idea is that our life is also like a war. We may not use physical weapons to fight, but we have to fight against difficult adversary, adversities, against our own weaknesses. And Arjuna is putting down his bow, saying, I can't fight. He's putting aside his bow, symbolizes our losing our determination. I can't fight. I can't do it. So just as uh, sometimes seeing the sheer size of the problems in the world, seeing the sheer size of the, of the difficulties facing, facing us, we might lose heart. So Arjuna, in that sense, represents all of us. Just as we might perceive things in a particular way that makes us lose heart, Arjuna also loses heart. And that is the metaphorical aspect. So the metaphysical aspect is even deeper. The metaphysical is that this is a philosophical truth being revealed over here. Philo philosophically speaking, all of us are souls and the body is like a chariot for us. And Krishna is, the is present in the heart as a super soul. We will talk about this later. But the metaphysical understanding is that the battlefield represents the, uh, the way each one of us is present in the world. And the God is right next to us. But initially, what happens is Arjuna is instructing Krishna. Take me in between the two armies. I will not fight. So as long as the soul orders God or soul demands from God, even if some of the orders are fulfilled, even if some of the demands are met, still the soul will end up in delusion. By the end of the Bhagavad Gita, what happens is, it is rather than demanding that Krishna do his will, Arjuna starts doing Krishna's will. So, that is the metaphysical inversion of the chain that the Bhagavad Gita brings about in Arjuna and the Bhagavad Gita's knowledge can bring about in all of us. And I, I write in the Bhagavad Gita every day and the Gita .com, so This is an article from its extract over here. Krishna, by his presence and presentation, lifts Arjuna out of both the outer and the inner battlefields. The supreme teacher takes his student to magnificent summits of wisdom that the world has rarely scaled before or after. When they return to the battlefield at the end of the Gita, Arjuna is intellectually illumined, spiritually strengthened, and emotionally enlivened. So it addresses the, the head, the, the intelligence, the mind, and the soul all together. So the Bhagavad Gita starts from the battlefield, but Krishna, by his expertise, he transforms the battlefield into the classroom. And in the classroom, he raises the awareness, the consciousness far above the battlefield. So that is the significance of the first chapter. The first chapter provides the setting where a battlefield will transform into a classroom. And what happens in the classroom? will be described from the subsequent chapters. So now, in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it dives into the philosophy quite deeply. So this is the overview of the second chapter. There are 72 verses in the second chapter. And first, Arjuna is arguing. Although he's rejected, he knows that he has a duty to fight and doesn't want to fight. So he's justifying that. So he moves from argumentation to submission. He says, okay, I will, I will fight. I will seek answers from you. I will elaborate. I'll quickly go over the flow of the second chapter and we will uh, elaborate as we move forward. Now from argumentation to submission, he says, I surrender to you. And that's when Krishna starts speaking 
wisdom, spiritual wisdom, philosophical wisdom. And Arjuna's question is, what should I do? Should I fight or should I not fight? What should I do? And Krishna does not answer that question specifically. Krishna answers the question by giving Arjuna a framework for finding the answers to the questions. So 11 to 30, he says, if you want to decide what to do, first you need to know who you are. To decide activity, first determine your identity. The Bhagavad Gita spotlights the a spiritual essence of us, the idea that we are souls. And understanding we are souls will determine how best we can function. Then after that, 31 to 37, Arjuna is very distressed. How can I fight? We will lose. So the spiritual vision leads to a long-term material vision and it leads to a material victory. Is how materially also things will turn out good if Arjuna acts with spiritual knowledge that is described. But the purpose of spiritual knowledge is not just material well-being. It is spiritual well-being. Now, spiritual victory, how the spiritual vision leads to spiritual victory is described in her text 38 to 53. And how one becomes elevated in consciousness and ultimately liberated by spiritual knowledge. And now when Krishna is talking about spiritual victory like this, Arjuna has a question, will this person who is spiritually victorious, who is liberated, who is absorbed in transcendence, will such a person fight a war? So in trying to understand that, he asks the question, what are the characteristics of a spiritually victorious person, of a spiritually successful person? And Krishna describes those characteristics. And in describing those characteristics, he Focus, he uh, also outlines a path how, as seekers, we can also move towards spiritual victory. So both are done together by Krishna in this section. So now, in the, the first chapter has ended with Arjuna speaking that I will not fight. Uh, he's saying, I will not fight. At that time, Krishna uh, begins not by immediately instructing him. Generally, knowledge is best received when it is desired. So when somebody has already given a decision, I will not do this. Then Krishna doesn't, uh, Krishna simply responds by saying, this is weakness. How can you be weak like this, O Arjuna, when you are in the face of a war? It's the biggest war of your life. And Arjuna tries to say, I'm not weak. Actually, I'm thoughtful. Actually, Arjuna is, thinks he's thoughtful, but actually his thoughts are making him a fool. His thoughts are confusing him, are disorienting him. And then fight, he starts thinking, if I don't fight, okay, I'm saying I'll not fight, but if I don't fight, what is going to happen? I don't want to kill them, but they will kill me. And not only me, they will kill all my all my brothers and all our family. And if we don't do that, then we will have to, if we flee from the battlefield, then we will have to live in poverty. So none of the options seem feasible for him. Fighting and dying, not fighting and fleeing, fighting and killing. None of these options are feasible. So he says, I surrender to you. And Arjuna's question is very important. So understand, this is how to understand the Bhagavad Gita's essence. This is from Gita. Understand the question to understand the answer. Mm -hmm. Suppose we join a class during the question answer session. And if we join it at a time when the question has already been spoken and a speaker is giving the answer, we may get confused. What is going on over here? What is this? What is the speaker talking about? So similarly, if you want to understand the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita addresses many subjects within its flow. And because the Bhagavad Gita is spoken on the battlefield, you might think, is the Bhagavad Gita talking about violence? What is the Gita talking about? So we need to understand the question that Arjuna has asked so that he can understand the answer that Krishna has given. Sometimes the answer might also be very long and elab uh, intricate, but the unifying thread of thought in the answer will be uh, 
in that all that is being spoken is addressing the question. So if you understand Arjuna's question, then that can be the unifying thread of thought for us to understand uh, what Krishna speaks in the Bhagavad Gita. So Arjuna's question is, I'm asking you, what is dharma? There is two steps the question. And dharma refers not to some sectarian religious ritual, but to the universal path of harmony. It connotes the right course of action, the action that will bring us in harmony with our essential nature and the world's essential nature. So he asks, Arjuna is asking, what is the right thing to do? We all have certain values. And our values guide us in our actions. Now, if we see something, we see some a wallet lying on the ground, you might want to pick it up. That might be the impulse. Let me take it. But if you have a value of honesty, say, oh, I'll not pick this up. So our values often guide us towards the right actions when our impulses uh, may mislead us. And it's important to have values. But we don't just need values. We need the right, we don't need just the right values. We need the right hierarchy of values. The right hierarchy means that, say, <clears throat> if a judge is going to judge a person who is a criminal, who has committed a robbery, who has a severe robbery, he has committed. And the judge's value is to impartially judge uh, the case and give the punishment or the reward fairly. But suppose the person who has been accused, the defendant over there, is the judge's own son. Now the judge has one value of honesty, integrity. The judge has another value. As a father, I'm meant to protect my son. So now which value should be given greater priority? So there is, we need not just values. Life is very complex. Values can be guides, but sometimes competing values come up. So the Bhagavad Gita gives a philosophy which helps Arjuna understand the right hierarchy of values. And then once the right hierarchy of values is there, then we can choose which value needs to be given the most priority and accordingly we can choose our actions. So Arjuna's question is, how can I, how can I, what can I do right now? How can I fight? What is the right course of action? And Krishna gives the answer to that by speaking the philosophy of the Gita. And for speaking the philosophy of the Gita, the first thing that Krishna tells Arjuna is that you are, your identity goes beyond your biology. So actually, we all suffer in life. Suffering defines the human condition. But the human condition doesn't define us. That the first point that the Bhagavad Gita says that we are not just human beings. Arjuna is a great warrior and yet he's suffering terribly, suffering so much that he's crying in the middle of the battlefield. Uh, is crying in public. Most of us, even when we are overwhelmed, we don't cry uh, in public in front of everyone. But Arjuna is crying. Now, Arjuna is, is a warrior. Warriors are trained not to show pain because otherwise the enemy will exploit that pain. So the warriors conceal their emotions and yet Arjuna is in the position of maximum visibility in between the two armies. Everybody from both sides can see him and everybody sees his emotional breakdown. Actually, it's not just an emotional breakdown, it is an ethical breakdown for him. What am I to do? And that breakdown is so traumatizing that he's in tears. Ashuru Purna collection and tears are flowing down from his eyes. So Arjuna is in a state of suffering. And sometimes we also are put in such terrible suffering. And life is tough. Everybody has to suffer sooner or later. So suffering defines the human condition. But the Gita's message is that the human condition doesn't define us. That beyond our suffering bodies and our suffering minds, there is the imperishable soul. 
and the soul is essentially who we are. So Arjun, Krishna helps Arjuna to raise his self-conception. So when Arjuna is suffering so much crying, how can suddenly he understand philosophy? It, studying philosophy requires some serious application of thought. The first insight that Krishna gives to him is that you exist above your situations. In life, whatever circumstances we face, they are meant to be like carpets. Krishna says that if you understand you are the soul, then whatever happens at the level of the body, whatever happens at the level of the mind, it is happening at a lower level of reality to you. Therefore, you can tolerate it. Now, when the carpets come above us, if the carpet is above us, then that will make us suffocated and blinded. But similarly, when our situations and emotions overwhelm us, we, we feel suffocated and blinded. The Bhagavad Gita's knowledge raises Arjuna above. So that's the first lesson. That if you want to understand what to do, understand who you are. So I look at, now we're looking at 11 to 30 to decide activity. First, determine the identity. And discuss, understand the question, understand the answer. And see circumstances like carpets. Suffering defines the human condition, but the human condition does not define us. So now the idea that there is a soul beyond the body. Is this, a, is this just a, a religious belief? Or is it a reasonable philosophical proposition? So Krishna talks about this in multiple ways. The first way he talks about is, is simply observational and inferential. That we observe, that we change. Sometimes we may play with our friends in our, in our adulthood. We have a childhood school picture. They say, identify me over there. Now, some people might be able to identify. Some people might just not be able to identify. Because we change so much. So now when we say we, so we meet somebody after say, 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, you have changed so much. Now, it's you have changed. So we are saying the you is still the same, but the change is also there. So what is unchanging beyond the changing? There is a core to us that is unchanging. Whereas now if we had a car, and suppose conceptually, if we replaced every part of the car one by one by one by one, now you could say it would be a new car. There is nothing more to the car apart from the parts of apart from its parts. The car is basically a combination of its parts. But in a human being, conceivably, we could replace their arms, we could replace their legs, we could replace maybe future technology. We could replace all the parts of their body. So, but would the person still be the same? Or would the person be entirely different? The researchers I found that even if we, uh, if we consider the body, the source of consciousness does not exist in the body. The source of consciousness does not exist in the brain. There is a well-known experiment done by <coughs> Dr. Wilder Penfield. He's considered the father of neurosurgery. He's a Nobel laureate from uh, Canada. And he had experiments where he had people probing the people probing the uh, he asked the subject if somebody probed their brain now the brain is connected with the body so if a particular part of the brain is activated the hand rises up the hand rises up uh, then he asked the subject okay if the part of the brain is activated say electrodes are there in the brain and they're electrically activated and the hand rises up so he asked him, are you, uh, what did you, what happened? He says, my hand went up. Did you raise your hand? He said, I didn't raise my hand. You raised my hand. Then after that, he stopped the probes. And then he asked the subject to raise the hand. When he raised the hand, again, the brain, that part of the brain got activated. So now the question is raised is here that, the activation of the brain leads to the raising of the hand or the lowering of the hand. And the deactivation of the brain leads to the raising or the lowering of the hand. And that's what happened in the both cases. First, when the 
the scientist, Dr. Penfield, activated the probe. And the second is when the subject themselves activated, decided to raise the hand. Now, in the second case, the subject was saying, I raised my hand. And the first case, the subject was saying, I did not raise my hand, you raised it. What that basically means is the brain is, is like the tool for the physical operation. The brain is not the source of the intention. It's like if I have a print, if I have a computer with a print, print button, and as soon as I press the print button, the printer starts moving, the printer hand starts moving. Now you can come and press the print button, and again the printer hand will start moving. And if you have pressed the print button and the printer hand starts moving, I'll say that the printer hand is moving, but I didn't move it, you moved it. So Dr. Penfield said that the source of consciousness is extracerebral. The brain is like a, a computer, but it is, but what programs it is something outside, is something beyond. So that is a very significant point. This is a significant scientific pointer to it. Another way, so this is a scientific point. Another way we could look at it is that we all have a deep longing for immortality. So Krishna points to this imperishability of consciousness in 217 when he says, Avinashitu tadviddi yena sarvam idam tatam vinasham avyasyasya nakashchit kartu marhati that he says, there is, the body is perishable but something pervades the body that is imperishable. And that imperishable is the consciousness. And that consciousness comes from the soul. So when he speaks this, his purpose primarily is to highlight the point that Arjuna don't get caught by in the emotions that arise from physical destruction. Because physical destruction is not the ultimate reality. So the point of talking that you are not the body and the soul is that physical destruction is not ultimate destruction. So again, this brings us to the question, why do we not want to die? We say, obviously, nobody wants to die, but why not? Nothing around us is lasts, for, lasts forever. Even the huge Himalayan mountains, Mount Everest is also not eternal. The Twin Towers is also, was not also not eternal. So nothing lasts forever, and yet we all have a deep longing to live forever. Where does this longing come from? This, this longing doesn't come from any external material situation. It has to come, it, has, it comes from somewhere else, somewhere from within. It's like a, a child who is living in a remote African village, unconnected with the world, suddenly desires. Mom, I want a pizza. The mother will ask, where did you come to know about a pizza from? Where did you desire a pizza? Where did that your desire for a pizza come from? Because there's nothing in her, in the child's environment that would cause that desire. So our desire to live forever, our determination to try to ward off death by, the, by all possible means, that points to something eternal within us. And by this understanding of the eternal, Krishna changes Arjuna's frame of reference. <clears throat> and he says, don't get carried away by the emotions that I arise from physical destruction. Then he says, so this is, I did not talk, talk about, 211 to 30. I talk about that too. Yeah, 10 to 31 to 37. So here what happens? Krishna says, what is the practical use of understanding that you are not the body or the soul? That you are a spiritual being. The spiritual vision will lead to material victory. Now what does material victory in this context mean? He tells Arjuna, you're fighting over here. If you fight and if you win, what will happen is, you will gain the kingdom of the earth. If you fight and if you lose, then you will die, but you are eternal. You are a soul, and a soul, because you have fought heroically, you have fought in a virtuous war. You have fought for establishing dharma. Even if you were defeated, 
your soul will not be defeated. You will get the reward for your heroism by being elevated to the heavens. And there you will enjoy heavenly pleasures. So he tells him that this is actually a win-win situation. Hatova prapsis iswargam jitvava bhokshisemahim asmad uttishtha kaunteya yuddhaya kutta nishchaya. So, in 237, he says, therefore, arise and fight because either way you win. Either way, it means if you fight and win or you fight and lose, both ways you win. So, the idea that we are a soul gives, a, gives our life a meaning that transcends our present lifetime. We all sometimes go through phases in our life where, where nothing seems to be working, where everything seems to be futile. And generally, we all need meaning. We want to do something meaningful in our lives. So uh, we all want pleasure, but actually it's not just pleasure that we want. So what we want is meaningful pleasure. And all of us could just, if suppose tomorrow we are free from all our financial obligations, all our family obligations, all our professional obligations, and somebody told us, you just watch comedy for the rest of your life, from morning to night. So you might watch for a few minutes, for a few hours at the most, but after that you'll get bored. You want to do something worthwhile, something meaningful, something stimulating. Just watching comedies eventually becomes meaningless. So what we want is meaningful pleasure. And meaningful pleasure comes when we understand that life itself is meaningful. And death is the ultimate destroyer of meaning. Why is death the, death the destroyer of meaning? So we study, we work, we want to get a particular job, a particular degree, a particular vision of life. And then suddenly, everything is destroyed. It's like somebody is trying to draw a beautiful piece of art on a whiteboard. And they're carefully making each line. And as they're carefully making each line, suddenly some wiper comes up on the board and swish, everything gets wiped off. Then we may think, if I'm going to put so much effort to draw something and everything is going to get wiped off suddenly, why should I draw at all? So if we consider death, we are trying to, if we, are, if we consider our life and our death, that we are trying to draw something beautiful on the canvas of our life. And death comes like a wiper at any moment and wipes everything off. So if this life is all that is where there, life ultimately will be meaningless. And Krishna tells Arjuna, it's not like that. That even if you are defeated or even if you are victorious, if you act beautifully, then you will be creating an auspicious future for yourself. So a spiritual vision in this way brings meaning to our life. That what we are doing, even if it doesn't, even if the fruit doesn't come in this life, the fruit will carry on and manifest in a future life. That's how Krishna solaces Arjuna by giving him an extended vision beyond this life. So this is the second section of the Gita. And the uh, second section of the uh, second session. So, second chapter's first part. So, any questions or comments at this point? Yes. Barbara, you had a question? Oh, actually, I, I do have a question. Can yeah, you hear I'm me? Unmuted. Yeah, I, I'm unmuted you now. Oh, thank you. Um, somebody walked by and talked to me right while you were saying the most important thing. <laughs> I've been uh, obsessed with the idea of suffering. I had a parent who tried to shield me from suffering and you were saying something about, can you just speak a little bit? I know it's a big topic, but how we find solace and meaning and, and not to fear suffering. I mean, Jesus and all the disciples suffered so terribly and they were like God's favorites and it, the news is so scary. And, um, I would like to not worry so much about my material comfort and be free from that fear, if that is not too big a topic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Depending on, are there any other questions? 
So based on that, I'll decide how much time to spend on this question. If anybody has, you can raise their hand. I won't answer right now, but I'll at least have an awareness. Okay. Okay. So now when we uh, see suffering in life, suffering in the world around us, we have ourselves gone through suffering. So how can we have meaning and purpose in spite of the presence of suffering? So basically, we begin with the point that at least some parts of our life have meaning. That means that we treat our life innately as meaningful. We take decisions, we take decisions thoughtfully. And on many occasions, when we are responsible, say a student who studies responsibly gets better grades than a student who doesn't study responsibly. Now, of course, we may say there are exceptions and there are sometimes some students may cheat or whatever. That is true, but those are exceptions. Broadly speaking, we do see that our actions have results. If we are sick, and if we take the medicine properly, we do our exercise well, we, re we re regulate our diet, our condition improves. So we do see that our actions can make a difference. And when I talk about meaning, the word meaning itself mean, can, be very, can be very broad. But basically what, what we mean by meaning is that there is an order to the structure of reality. And if we understand that order that is there to the structure of reality, then if we do a particular action, we will get a predicted result. So that means we, by understanding the order of the structure, order of the structure of reality, we can create a better reality for ourselves. So science is also a search for this. When Newton saw the fruit falling, he asked what makes this fruit, fruit fall? And he came up with the principle of gravity. So basically, science tries to understand the order in the structure of reality at the material level. And then after 200, 300 years, when gravity became like a bedrock of physics, classical physics, then suddenly at extremes, at extremes means at the microscopic level, the macroscopic level, gravity stopped working at the fundamental particles level, at the cosmic level. Then scientists didn't say that, oh, there is no order to the structure of reality. They tried to find a bigger theory which could explain that. And that's how science came up with quantum physics and relativity to explain what gravity couldn't explain. So gravity was like a, is now considered a sub-theory within the relativity theory. So without going to the technicalities of this, if you are not from scientific background, don't worry. The principle I'm making, of, the principle I am conveying through this is that uh, at, a, at a normal experiential level, these do see that reality has some order. If we sit in a twisted position for a long time, our body pains. If we sit properly, our body, uh, relatively speaking, doesn't pain. So we do see some correlation with action and reaction. And by choosing actions wisely, we can create a better reality for ourselves. So when this sometimes doesn't happen, when suffering seems to come arbitrarily. At that time, basically, we, we start feeling that either reality is disorderly, oh, like the law of gravity is not working. Nature doesn't work according to order. Or maybe there's a bigger theory which explains the structure of reality. So that bigger theory is what the Bhagavad Gita offers. The bigger theory is that, yes, our actions do have constant results. Our choices do matter. But it is not just our present choices that determine our present results. Our past also affects. And past can refer to not just past in this life, but in the previous lives also. So when suffering comes upon us, either we can say that it's arbitrary 
or it's just a result of something coming from the past. But again, that means it's our actions that have power. If we focus on choosing wisely right now, then irrespective of whether we get the results immediately or not, we will be creating a better future for ourselves. So for us to see suffering in context, we need to expand our perception of reality. And ex expand our perception of reality to see that even when something seems disorderly, actually there's a bigger order. My this action has not led to any result, but this action is contributing to a gradual future result, which may not be seen right now. So we expand our vision the, for the length of our existence, and not the length of our existence, also the breadth of our existence. Length means we exist beyond this life. We existed before this world, and we exist beyond this world. And breadth means that we exist not just at the physical level. We have the, there's the body, there's the mind, and there's the soul. So this expansion in terms of length and breadth of our existence, this can help us to see suffering in context. That means we may have to live with pain, but we won't have to live in pain. To the extent we get a spiritual vision of life, we see that pain is a part of life, but pain doesn't have to be a whole of my life. Right now, I might be going through a painful phase, but it's a phase. It's a storm, and the storm will end. So there can be big hurricanes, and nowadays, they seem to be happening with great frequency. But actually, it's more that more people are living and more homes are there. So there is more, rather than hurricanes coming more, it's there is more in the path of the hurricanes that's causing damage. But either way, the point is when the storms come, uh, we just have to wait them out. We can't stop the storm, but we can wait out the storm. And if we have built a safe shelter or we have retreated to a safe shelter, the storm will come, the storm will go, but it won't affect us. It won't, it won't personally destroy us. So similarly, during the normal times of our life, we need to be building a spiritual shelter for ourselves. A spiritual shelter means we gain spiritual knowledge. We engage in spiritual practices. And we develop our spiritual consciousness so that we start gaining a greater and greater sense, a greater and greater realization that I exist, that my essential self exists beyond the body. I'll conclude with one metaphor which I was going to give at the end of this session. It comes in this, toward the end of this chapter, 270. Krishna says, we need to make our consciousness like an ocean, not like a puddle. Imagine if it's a puddle and a small puddle of water and a sudden a river, a river suddenly flows into it. The puddle will be devastated. There will be overflow of water everywhere and there will be devastation. Oh. But if a river flows into an ocean, then the river, the ocean is so large, the river will absorb it. So if our consciousness is like a puddle, then life's sufferings will overwhelm us. But if our consciousness is like an ocean, and life's sufferings which are like rivers flowing in, they won't trouble us that much. The whole process of spirituality is actually to expand our consciousness from being a puddle to being an ocean. And how does that expansion happen? The size of our consciousness depends on the size of what is in the consciousness. If my consciousness is attached to cricket or baseball and my favorite team loses, then I will feel devastated, shattered, infuriated. Now, sports is for entertainment, but if that is the dominating thing in my consciousness, then I am at the mercy of players and their forms over which I have practically no control at all. So it's like if the storm comes, we are swept away. If the river comes, we are swept away. We have no shelter at all. But if we, if we are attached to the Supreme, if we are attached to the Divine, if we are attached to God, Krishna, He is the unshakable anchor. He is the shelter that never falls. 
and he's the supreme spiritual reality understanding our own indestructible spirituality and understanding god's infallible supremacy that creates a shelter for ourselves and when our consciousness is sheltered thus that suffering doesn't affect us so much our consciousness becomes like a ocean and rivers of sufferings don't trouble us that much are there any other questions okay sorry but that was your question question answered barbara um yes that was that was very 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 helpful and um i made a lot of notes <laughs> and can you oh. hear me um yes, yes, maybe um this is not for today but maybe for another time i think part b would be um how do we learn this is not for now i know that but how do we learn to feel safe and trust god if our faith is new when we might have karma coming at us that we created and god is going to let us go through it <laughs> but that is a question for another time i think um okay is I there think any other question hmm? is there any other question otherwise i can answer for a few minutes thank you so much ma thank you so much thank you okay so okay so I'll, uh, there's no other question i'll ask and address barbara's question quickly so um, so how can we feel secure when maybe some past karma is coming upon us and we are going through difficulties and there are three i would say broadly at three levels one of the first is through knowledge knowledge means that the knowledge that i am eternal whereas the suffering is temporary uh, one of my friends i gave this example once in a class and then and i gave it in florida one of my friends told me he actually had this experience i suppose we are going through some forested area and some leech creature that sucks blood comes and bites our leg now when the leech is biting at that time it can be it's it's so scary because we can feel the leech tentacles going into our skin and sucking our blood and the normal reaction would be to just catch the leech and to rip it out to pull it away now some leeches are so strong their grip is such that if we try to pull out the leech it will pull out our whole skin and the solution there is to just let the leech do its business say what sucking my blood how can i let it do its business no although it is sucking its blood it does not have an unlimited capacity to suck blood it has its tubules and once the tubules are full then it just lets it it itself will let go and you flip up with a thumb a finger and it will fall off so similarly for us sometimes some situations are just unavoidable and at that time it just okay this is the situation it's like a leech if i try to pull out it will make things worse but it's not going to be there forever so the knowledge that things are temporary whereas we are eternal that helps and if we look back at our lives we have survived many many problems in the past also we are each every soul is intrinsically a survivor so we will survive this also that's the first thing knowledge second is we need not just knowledge but spiritual experience that means we have to find out something which gives us a higher experience it might be mantra chanting it might be kirtan it might be hearing some wisdom talk it might be just going to a temple or a holy place it might just be being in the presence of someone hearing somebody's talks or it might be just praying or uh, internalizing our philosophy through journaling or whatever it might be we have to find out what it is that gives us a spiritual experience or a spiritual orientation to our consciousness on a regular basis if we consider two circles the circle of things which we like to do and circle of things which are uplifting for us now 
if the two would be entirely identical, life would be wonderful. But quite often the two are not. But that doesn't mean the two are entirely separate. If we find some intersection between the two. And that point of intersection between what we like to do and what is uplifting for us, that can be our source of strength and succor by which we can feel good in a way that does not take us away from good, but rather takes us toward good. So during our normal life, we have to do some self-observation to find out what lies at the intersection of those two circles and then keep that readily accessible to us so that amid these difficult times, we can we can turn, we can have, we can do those things and raise ourselves up. And lastly, I talk about knowledge, I talk about experience, or keeping the source something which is a source of experience ready available for us. And third, ultimately, is we could say attachment to Krishna. Generally, it is very difficult for us to let go of anything. If we want to put something behind us, we need to put something ahead of us. If we have to let go of something, we have to catch hold of something. So, ultimately, the most uh, valuable thing in the world is Krishna. And sometimes, uh, we don't turn toward Krishna wholeheartedly till whatever we have turned toward doesn't break down. The example of Dhritarashtra is that Dhritarashtra is the person who spoke the, who who begins, whose question begins the Bhagavad Gita. And Dhritarashtra had to lose everything before he lost his attachments. His attachments had made him blind and he had to lose everything before, before he lost those blinding attachments. So for all of us also, sometimes uh, when distress comes, the purpose of the distress is not to destroy that which is uh, dear to us. Often the purpose of the distress is to take away that which is presently dear to us so that we can turn toward that which is eternally dear to us. So. If we have that attitude that when suffering comes, suffering is for a purpose. It's like when a, when a bird is in a nest, sorry, bird is in an egg, it's safe over there. But then as it grows, it can't stay over there. And when it tries to break the shell, sometimes the shell cracks back after, shell breaks slightly and then snaps back. And maybe its its feathers or its wings get trapped over there. It's painful, but again it pushes, again it pushes, and then again the uh, shell snaps back. Now, the, if the mother bird is nearby, the mother bird would just break the shell. But then the baby bird would come out, but its wings would not be strong enough to fly, and the wings would and the baby bird would be an easy prey for any predators. So the baby bird has to go through its own struggle. And inside the shell is painful, it's comfortable. Breaking the shell is painful. But once the shell, once the bird comes out of the shell, then there is, then there is the freedom to fly high into the sky. So similarly for us, if we have that understanding, or at least we are open to exploring that understanding that maybe this there was order in my life, but that order was like the order inside a shell. Now the shell is cracking. And this transition is chaos. It's painful. But from order through chaos to a higher order, there will be a greater freedom awaiting me. So we have nothing to lose if, if we are going to take the nihilistic way and say that life is arbitrary suffering then that is only going to make us feel worse so if we can have the positive frame of reference then we can move forward and we will come to a better place we'll become more spiritually evolved we'll come closer to krishna so 
the purpose of if we see that distress is ultimately going to take us toward Krishna, then we won't be so distressed by life's adversities. We will have that confidence and that can help us to feel shelter even amidst distress. Okay. Does anyone else have any one more question? Okay. So I'll move on to the last part now. Let's go back to the second chapter overview and then I'll move to the last part. So I talked about how spiritual vision leads to material victory. That how our Krishna tells Arjuna that if not in this world, you will attain victory in the next world. You will attain heavens and you will be happy over there with heavenly pleasures. The Bhagavad Gita uh, has a very interesting understanding of the afterlife. Generally, even in the, if we consider Abrahamic religions, there is this life and beyond that there is another life. And if we have lived devoted to God, then we attain an eternal life over there. The afterlife is considered to be eternal life. But the Bhagavad Gita differentiates between a material vision of the afterlife and a spiritual vision of the afterlife. Afterlife literally means what comes after this life is over. So a material vision of the afterlife is that in the next life, I will enjoy all the pleasures that either I was not enjoying here, but because I lived so virtuously, so well, I will enjoy there. Or I was enjoying here, but because I lived virtually, I, virtuously, I will enjoy them better. So we could say this is a material conception of afterlife. And this material conception can very easily be uh, exploited by self-interested people. How exploited? So just the understanding that we live beyond this life itself doesn't necessarily make uh, life intrinsically meaningful or make or inspire us to live virtuously. We can see in the example of, uh, in some religions, there is religious extremism and uh, uh, there are some religious teachers who tell gullible followers that you, you kill for the sake of God. And then if you die while killing for the sake of God, you will go to paradise and you will enjoy with 73 virgins forever in paradise. And now those who become terrorists like this and kill and die, they may take the name of God. Extremists use the name of God to give God a bad name. But what are they doing? No, they may be laying down, they may be killing and dying, they may be laying down their life. But are they laying down their life out of for the love of God? or for the love of those virgins whom they are imagining they will get over there in the next world. So <clears throat> that idea that paradise is a place for materialistic pleasures, better materialistic pleasures than this world, that can often make people very gullible we don't want to just expand. As I said earlier, we want to expand our conception of life, but we also also broaden our conception of life, of our existence rather. Expand our conception of life means we understand I'm a soul. Uh, that means I exist. My existence continues beyond this body. But also we need to understand that my existence is broader than my body. That is, I am a soul. And that means... The soul's interests are not necessarily the same as the body's interests. Bodily pleasures will not make the soul enriched or fulfilled. So that is the transition the Bhagavad Gita takes forward from 38th text. And there is a dramatic change from text 37 to 38. Text 37, Krishna is giving 
profit loss calculation. He says, if you win, then you get the earth. If you lose, you get the heavens. But suddenly in text 38, Krishna changes the frame of reference and he says, don't worry about profit or loss. Sukhe dukhe same kutva lava lava ujaya jayo tato yudha yajaswa naivam papam vapsisi he says that don't bother about happiness or distress or victory or failure or gain or loss. Just do your duty. Now this might seem opposite what's going on over here. See Krishna is talking now about something deeper. Later on in this section, Krishna will tell a verse which is quite well known and quite paradoxical. Krishna says, work without attachment to the fruits of the work. He says that work, but we detach from the results. And this seems extremely counterintuitive. Most of us work for the results. We work so that, uh, say if we are studying, we work so that we can get particular kind of grades, so that we may get a good job or we may get admission into a particular college. If we are doing our jobs, then we work so that we get the salary, so that we can maintain our life, our lifestyle, take care of our loved ones, fulfill our desires. So we work for the result. So what does Krishna mean when he says don't work for the result? Don't be attached to the result. That's what he's saying. And in fact, it's not just from a functional perspective that we seek the results, but even from a motivational perspective. You know, it is often said that if you, if you envision the desired result that you want, then that will inspire you, that will motivate you, and then you will move forward. So what is going on over here when Krishna says, that be detached from the results of your work. So he's saying something which is very deep. He's saying that, when, again, as like earlier I said, we cannot be detached so easily from anything. To be detached from one thing, we need to be attached to something bigger. So what Krishna tells Arjuna is that be attached to something bigger than the result. I'll give a couple of examples to illustrate this point. One of my main um, services is writing. I write on the Gita every day. Uh, and now, as an author, I've been writing for 15 years. So initially, whenever I would write, uh, I would be very eager how many people read my article and who all appreciates it. And if people wouldn't appreciate it, I would feel quite disappointed. And now, as I've written this, at least the Gita articles, I've written several thousand articles, almost 4,000, 3,000, 4,000. So each article is, is extremely meaningful and absorbing for me while I write it. But after it is written, yes, if somebody likes the article, somebody appreciates the article, that's, that's, that's nice. But for me, the writing itself gives a deep absorption. And I feel connected with Krishna through that. And I feel that I'm contributing using my intelligence through that. So basically, writing is a functional activity by which you communicate something to someone. But writing, especially when we're doing it for something spiritual, or something deeply connected with us, the writing is not as a functional activity, it is a transformational activity. Writing helps us to connect deeper with the subject. Writing helps us to connect deeper with ourselves and the subject is ourselves. So over a period of time, at least I have got a small understanding that writing gives me something far bigger than just the appreciation of those who read it. Now, obviously, if I write it, I'll publish it and I would like people to read it. But my, for my own absorption in Krishna and my own connection with Krishna has over a period of time become at least as important, if not more important, than how my writing is received by others. 
So what Krishna is telling here is, when he says, don't be attached to the results or be detached from the results, it is not a recipe for impracticality or irresponsibility. He's not saying don't care for the results. He's saying that the results are a part of something bigger. And if you get too caught in the results, then you'll miss out on something bigger. Just like if a student is studying for an exam, then, okay, so the student getting the grade is important, but suppose somebody is somebody studying something which is very, uh, very life-saving. Suppose somebody, somebody, suppose somebody is studying medicine. Now, the medical student also has to get marks. But if they're studying the subject carefully, understanding the body, understanding the diseases, understanding the various medicines, then the medical knowledge that they gain is far more important than the marks. And the marks may sometimes come, the marks may sometimes not come, but the medical knowledge, they have gained it, that is going to be there with them forever. Somebody might just memorize and get some grades, get some marks, but if they don't have the subject's knowledge, then they will not be good doctors. So what Krishna says over here is that every work that we do, it has an outer result and it has an inner result. The outer result is, say, if, now in the case, specific case of Arjuna, he fights. So there'll be outer result, he will either win or he will lose. Uh, those are the outer results. But Krishna says, if you, are, O Arjuna, are working with spiritual understanding, with the understanding that you are a soul, and as a soul, you act in a mood of beautifulness, then that knowledge will elevate you spiritually. That knowledge will help you understand yourself. So that, not that knowledge, that activity. That activity of doing your duty will help you grow spiritually. And that spiritual growth is far more uh, consequential, far more enduring than the material result that you may get. So just like, so this is the other side of um, the previous analysis. Like earlier I said that uh, the actions that we do, sometimes they don't produce a desired result because, or sometimes we do good, but we get bad. That's because our present actions alone are not the cause of the results. Our past actions also contribute to it. So similarly, Krishna is saying, our present actions right now, they're not just going to produce you the immediate result, but the present actions are also going to contribute to something bigger for you. The bigger is the reshaping of our consciousness. The Each action that we do, it causes impressions on us. Krishna is saying if you act with spiritual knowledge, then that will create spiritual impressions within you. And your spiritual impressions will elevate you, will ultimately liberate you. So here, that's why Krishna shifts the rationale from working with uh, gain-loss considerations to working without those considerations for something higher. To work for your own spiritual understanding, for your spiritual realization. So Krishna says to Arjuna that if you work in this way, you will be elevated and you will be liberated. You will attain lasting peace. Now, when he speaks this, at this point, that this is the section from 38 to 53. So spiritual victory is where ultimately we re realize our spirituality. The soul is eternal and the soul become, belongs to an eternal arena of reality. And in that eternal arena of reality, the soul lives eternally, happily, spiritually. So attaining that is the ultimate victory. Not just getting better material pleasures, but getting the ultimate, the eternal spiritual connection, the eternal spiritual realization. That's what Krishna says, Arjuna, you will get by your spiritual practices. If you work in a mood of detachment without getting obsessed with the results immediately, then at this point, Arjuna has a question. See, normally, uh, when a speaker is speaking, the audience at best gets about 20% of what the speaker is speaking. And God only knows which 20% it will be. Sometimes the speaker makes some jokes and that's what the people, audience remembers. Because the audience has certain things going on in their mind. So now Arjuna is hearing all this philosophy, but what is going on in Arjuna's mind is, okay, 
we should I be fighting or should I not be fighting? When Krishna is doing work with detachment, then does it mean that what should I be doing actually? So he started thinking, he's a, he hears about his spiritually advanced people and he started thinking, okay, those who are spiritually elevated, spiritually liberated, will they fight? What do they do? So he asks a question. And he asks a question which is clearly a metaphorical question. He says, Arjuna, how do the spiritually realized people sit? How do they walk? How do they talk? What do they speak? Now when he asks how do they talk, he's not asking about are they fluent in English? Are they fluent in Sanskrit? He is asking, when, see, our speech is often our fundamental response to reality. Whenever something happens, something bad happens, we might use some foul words. And then I mean, you should not speak like this. You don't, don't use those bad words. So what happens is that we respond to reality at one level by our speech. So when Krishna is asking, how do they speak? He's asking, what is their verbal response? What is the nature of their verbal response to real, to the life's dualities, to ups and downs, to life's distresses? And then he says, how do they walk and how do they, how do they sit and how do they walk? He's not clearly talking about a fashion model to know in what pose that person sits or with what gait the person walks. Here, to sit and walk are used metaphorically. To refer, sitting refers to how does one, see when we are sitting, our senses are to some extent inactive, restrained. So he's talking about how does a person restrain their senses? And then he asks, how does a person engage their senses? When walks means, how do they engage their senses? And Krishna answered this question in various ways. I'll focus on two themes in this, one I talked about. So here, Krishna says that they stay equipoised. Equipoised means they don't get affected by good or bad. And Krishna gives an example over here how we can avoid getting affected. He says, stay away from the storm. Get out of the way of the storm. So what is the storm? Krishna says that when we perceive things in the world, whatever we perceive has an effect on us. And say, for example, we observe. Suppose somebody observes somebody is having diabetes. They can't eat sweet food. But then they can't eat desserts, but then they see some delicacy, maybe a cake. You know, that's, that's observation. And from the observation comes contemplation. Hey, I start looking at it. And the contemplation leads to infatuation. Hey, that's nice. Infatuation leads to obsession. I want it. When we start off, there is a desire, we see it, there's, there's observation, contemplation, infatuation, obsession, infuriation, that there's delusion, that there's stupefaction, which is lose our intelligence. And then there's self-destruction. So now, normally, if we are in an ocean and a storm comes, we are, help uh, we are helpless. The storm just comes and sweeps us away. But quite often, the storms of desires that come within us, they, they come not just on their own. They come because we give them fuel. So it's that the more we contemplate on something, the bigger it becomes. Now this applies both to desires and to distresses. That the more we contemplate on some desire, it is stronger and stronger it will become. The more we contemplate on some distress, the bigger and bigger it will become. But I talked about managing distress earlier. In this section, I'll talk about managing desires. So Krishna says that don't get in the storm's way. So if we are in the ocean and know a storm is coming from a particular way, we would move away from that storm as quickly as possible. So similarly for all of us, if we know that there are certain situations that trigger stormy desires, certain objects, certain stimuli, that trigger stormy desires in us, then we get out of the way. Get out of the way doesn't mean that we become averse to those objects, that we demonize those objects. 
but that rather we don't dwell on those objects that whatever gets our attention gets us whatever gets our attention gets us and that's why krishna consciousness is about becoming conscious of krishna becoming conscious of a higher reality beyond ourselves and to the extent we become conscious of that higher reality to that extent we grow to that extent we rise above our the more the storms of desire that may come within us so krishna is telling arjuna over here that if you can live with this passion like this this passion now the word passion has a positive connotation where we say that we should all have a passion in our lives but the word passion in the bhagavad gita also has a negative connotation where passion is used in the sense of obsession so passion used positively in the sense of drive you should have a drive or zeal in life but passion used negatively means it is like a obsession so krishna says if you can live with this passion then you will live peacefully you will live fruitfully and toward the end of this chapter krishna gives the first reference to a theme which will recur later in the eighth chapter especially krishna says that if you can live in spiritual consciousness life long then you will be in spiritual consciousness at the time of death and if you are in spiritual consciousness at the time of death then you will attain eternal life so the criticality of consciousness at the time of death is what is talked about in the end of the second chapter as the last verse but krishna builds up toward that gradually by saying that you live in a way that is spiritually harmonious you live in a way that is not too obsessed with material pleasures or material troubles and if we live like that then we will leave from the world gracefully to attain spiritual fulfillment so i'll summarize what we spoke in this two chapters of the bhagavad gita i started by talking about the overview of the bhagavad gita's first chapter where we talked about on the battlefield the bhagavad gita begins with a godless assessment of the odds So there's the ascent. There is a godless person who just looks only at material things. That's Duryodhan. And then there is there's a godly person who gets confused. Arjuna has a has a determined intention, but there is perception. He gets he has a desire. He goes in the no man's land, and there he sees and he gets really deluded. So his confusion is being overwhelmed is because of. two duties pulling him in two different directions his warrior duty and his dynastic duty and he decides i can't fight cuz i'll be killing the people of my own dynasty at that time although at one level he is undecided he he is decided i won't fight i talked about the significance in the battlefield setting lit, the lit, it is literal but the point of the literal is not that to in, to incite war but to show that even a person who is a go getter like arjuna needs to know where to go and what to get so it is to show the urgency of spirituality and then i talk about the metaphorical understanding is that the body is like a chariot and for all of us god krishna is with us but just as arjuna loses his will to fight and puts aside his bow we also lose our will to fight in the battle of life we let perceptions overwhelm us and the metaphysical understanding is that the bhagavad gita represents the inversion of the chain of command rather than the soul ordering god the soul receives and does receives the will of god and tries to do the will of god that was the first chapter in the second chapter i talked about how first it begins with arjuna moves from argumentation to submission and then to understand what the gita message is we have to understand what the question what question it is answering and the question is what is the right thing to do what is dharma dharma is uh, so to answer this question krishna doesn't just give a simple answer do this or don't do this krishna gives arjuna a world view which helps him to put his values in the right hierarchy so we need not just the right values to guide us we need values not impulses to guide us but we don't don't need just values we need the right hierarchy of values and krishna gives to the bhagavad gita that right hierarchy of values 
he begins first by saying to to determine what you have to do to determine who you are first and i talked about how our existence the gavita reveals our existence to be longer and broader before this life and beyond this life and beyond this body to the mind and beyond the mind to the soul when we understand that we are souls then we rise above our situations our circumstances are like are like carpets which we want to keep below us not above us i also talked about how the idea of the soul is not just a, a religious belief there is strong inference that we can draw from the three things from the fact that our core sense of self will remain unchanging although we change all the body changes from how consciousness doesn't come from the brain but the brain is a tool for the consciousness i talked about the experiment by dr wilder penfield and thirdly from our long it's an inference from our longing for immortality that nothing around us lasts forever yet we want to last forever that doesn't come from our material situation it comes from our spiritual core and then understanding this this is 11 to 30 then spiritual vision leads to material victory that means krishna tells arjuna that if you fight and win you gain here if you lose you gain the spiritual world so you gain heavenly pleasure and so then i talked about how there can be a materialistic conception of the afterlife which can be cynically manipulated to mislead people into doing terrible things so that they can enjoy better pleasures in the high next world as is done to religious accepted as is done with respect to terrorists by their leaders so the bhagavad gita offers first it talks about profit loss and then it says go beyond profit loss and that is because spiritual vision can lead to better than material victory to spiritual victory and for that he says be detached from the results because your work can give you something much bigger than the results just like studying can give some grades but studying can give uh, knowledge mastery of a subject an educated mind that can do so much more for the world talk about medical knowledge i talk about my experience with writing writing helps me to share some message with others but writing helps me to absorb myself in krishna also and lastly arjuna has the question okay this person is spiritually victorious this is a person what will they do so that, this is a metaphorical question of how does the person speak and how do they sit and walk krishna answers by telling how they stay equipoised and to stay equipoised and the bhagavad gita gives two metaphors one is make your consciousness not like a puddle but like an ocean that is by expanding the size of what is present in the consciousness not small worldly things but the supreme being within it and secondly uh, it says that there are storms which arise in our consciousness and they begin by our indiscriminate contemplation of sense objects so get out of the storms way by not contemplating so if we if we live in a way that we contemplate the divine instead of the sense the contemplate the spiritual instead of the sensual then we will attain the spiritual at the end of our lives so on hearing all this arjuna has certain questions which he will ask in the start of the third chapter and that we will discuss in our next session next monday thank you very much hare krishna